In the last video, I looked at computer memory and talked about bandwidth and latencies. In this one, I will be going over how computers are going through ever increasingly tighter bandwidths and how they have evolved to mitigate the lower available bandwidths. Also, I will be looking at the performance scaling of CPUs in recent history despite tighter memory restrictions. So first, let's look at how memory bandwidth have changed since just the introduction of DDR RAM. If we look at the official JDEC documentation for the DDR spec, you can see that they outline file transfer frequencies 200, 266, 333 and 400 megatransfers per second. We will take the highest specified speed from each DDR revision. It doesn't matter which one we use because we're just comparing relative to other DDR generations. So as long as we take the same segment from each DDR generation, then it's going to give us the same trends. Now at 400 megatransfers per second, DDR has a measly bandwidth of 3.2 GB per second per memory channel, and just in case you're interested, the lowest DDR specs go down to 1.6 GB per second. That was pretty terrible, particularly by modern standards, but back in 2000, we had single core CPUs running at typically less than a GHz, so their ability to utilise the full memory bandwidth was very limited, whereas in the same DDR4 segment, that's DDR4 3200 megatransfers, providing about 25.6 GB per second per memory channel, and this is feeding a CPU in the case of Ryzen, maybe at 3.8 GHz, with 8 cores, and by virtue of having 8 cores, it's now possible for the CPU to require 8 times the memory bandwidth of one Ryzen core. So if we look at the memory bandwidth allocation of each core, that's 3.2 GB per second of memory bandwidth per core per memory channel, then that's what a Ryzen 7 can expect to get. Core for core, Ryzen has the same memory bandwidth available to it that a Pentium 3 did, despite the fact that the Ryzen CPU is going 4 times faster with around 60% higher core IPC when testing IPC with Wprime 1024. What this means is that a single Ryzen core at 4 GHz has 6.4 times the processing bandwidth as the Pentium 3, or, on all 8 cores, the Ryzen CPU has 51.2 times the processing bandwidth. Again, for W prime 1024. This means the Ryzen CPU gets 6.4 times the work per core done within the same memory bandwidth limitations. So with a vast increase in CPU performance over memory performance, how have CPUs overcome this massive memory restriction? Well as I said previously, memory access times have typically not changed since the inception of DRAM attached to a CPU. DDR400 has a typical cast latency of around 2.5 to 3 cycles as stated by JDEC. This is a latency of between 12.5 to 15 nanoseconds, whereas DDR4 can't expect better than those access times unless overclocked above the JDEC specified speeds. So not only are we battling lower relative bandwidths, but we're also not getting quicker access times. The way we get around these are with deeper buffers and higher levels of cache. This adds latency, and as I mentioned last time, if the speculative execution engines of a CPU can get the data from memory into the lowest level of cache before that data is actually required, then we feel like the memory access times and the memory bandwidth is that of the L1 cache and not the actual memory access times and bandwidths. To look at some real world examples of this in action, I'm going to look at some CPU performance scaling since the introduction of Intel Core i branding. I have taken Cinebench R15 scores for every i5 and i7. I will tell you why both later. The reason for Cinebench is that as I showed it a few videos ago, Cinebench R15 is quite intensive on the memory. I took my data from the Hardwarebot website, link in the description, and I have gathered a lot of data including things like CPU score per gigahertz and their memory bandwidth, which then allows me to make nice graphs of things like memory bandwidth per cine point per gigahertz, and even better, memory bandwidth per score per gigahertz per core. The last one is inherently adding some complications, leading to the datasets on the i5s that I'll look at soon. Firstly, we need to define IPC. If I say IPC is how much work per clock a CPU can do, am I right or am I wrong? Let's say Cinebench point per gigahertz. Is that IPC? Well yes and no. It would be for a single core CPU. But with 4 cores should we say IPC is how much work a car can do per clock, or how much work all cars can do per clock? Now in science we like to get rid of as many variables as possible, and so saying IPC is per 1 car per clock is what I'm going to go with for now. But looking at CPU's total throughput per clock on all cores is also interesting, and so from this point forwards I will be referring to CPU IPC and core IPC as two different things. CPU IPC is variable on a CPU rate, whereas core IPC is tied to the architecture. But we have another issue, and this brings on the i5s into it. 
You find looking at memory bandwidth per score per gigahertz per core, the i5s and i7s get different results even though at the silicon level they are the same chip. This is because the SMT in the i7s get 2 threads per core and I'm not willing to divide everything by the number of threads so I decided to gather data on the i5s as well so we can look at what happens to the IPC per core when one of those cores has SMT enabled. Oh and one more thing. This data was gathered by experiments by different people at different times on different machines with different clocks on memory and on the CPU. So whilst I can find the work per clock done by a CPU, this will be affected by memory clocks and vice versa, so there are bound to be some amount of errors. Lastly, note that there are two data points for Haswell, that's the fourth gen. The reason is that I got data on both Haswell and its refresh, so the 4770K, 4790K, 4670K and 4690K. Right, with that out of the way, let's get to the numbers, of which there will be links down to below. The first graph shows IPC through the generations, and you will notice that there are four lines on the graph. The blue and the green on top show the i7s and i5s IPC per core using the vertical scale on the left. The orange and the red lines shows the i7s and i5s CPU IPC using the vertical scale on the right. Now you will notice something interesting, other than a few errors I have made of course. The top pair and bottom pair look identical with the same gradient, almost like they are the same graph, just with one pair above the other, except for at the end. At the 8th generation, where the bottom graph spikes sharply, and yet the tops stay reasonably flat. The reason for this is due to the distinction between the two pairs being CPU IPC and Core IPC. The top graph is Core IPC, as such generations 6, 7 and 8 should have around the same IPC, which they almost do here, and as I said earlier, about different people on different machines. Anyway, that aside, the bottom pair of graphs show a massive spike in IPC in generation 8, even though they are the same architecture as gen 6 and 7. This is due to the core count increasing coffee, further demonstrating the need to get data on a per car basis. Now that we have looked at that, we can look at the graphs trend, which is a pretty strong positive trend in car IPC gains from the 1st gen to the 6th gen. That means, in the 7 or 8 years between those architectures, IPC has had a definite increase not only that, but also CPU clocks have continued to rise from the 1st gen i-series to the 7th gen. This shows us how the requirements of the system memory must keep increasing to keep these CPUs fed. And so next, I made a graph to look at how the memory bandwidth per car per work done has changed, and this one turned out to be quite the odd graph. This graph is unlike the rest, in that the two curves are severed in the middle. The reason for this is that the curves cross over from DDR3 to DDR4, and I want to see the scaling across generations, I've broken the curves between the DDR revisions. At the top where you can see the i5s, you will note that the i5 at X clock speed will appear to have more memory bandwidth available to it than its equivalent i7, and that's what it looks like from the graph. However, that's not quite right. It's not that it has more memory bandwidth, it's that it uses less, for the reason is simple, hyperthreading. The i7s have hyperthreading, Hyperthreading will further utilise the core, and as I'm not looking at the memory bandwidth per thread, just per core, the i7s will be more restricted as they have the same amount of cores, and yet their core has a higher IPC, thus needing more memory bandwidth at X clock speeds. Another interesting thing about this graph is that the i5 seems to be doing quite well for memory bandwidth. They start at around 12 megabytes per second per core per Cinebench point, and they have a nice increase all the way to Kaby Lake where they reach a peak of 17.5 megabytes per second until seemingly and unexpectedly dropping off a cliff at Coffee Lake, going all the way down to about 8.8 .8 megabytes per second. The reason is quite simple. The CPUs now have six cores, meaning that each core gets less bandwidth available from the memory. When it comes to the i7s, things are a little less predictable and more complicated. They start out at just over 8 megabytes per second and steadily climb to the third gen in which they begin a very large downwards trend in memory bandwidth per core per point. The reason for this is I can't really explain other than that maybe the Ivy Bridge i5s were an anomaly that I picked up as the result of only using one data sample. However, both the Haswell i7s that I got data from will less seem to be underperforming here. This is backed up by the fact that the Sandy Bridge i7 got the same normalised bandwidth as the i5s. So in short, whoever overclocked the i7 did a very good job on the memory and not quite a great job on the car. The next interesting thing to note is that the Broadwell seems to be also on a downwards trend. The reason I believe is that the next gen are to support DDR4 and thus such DDR3 has reached about its peak. 
DDR3 had an extremely long service life and so all the performance that could be made from it likely already had been, and as a result CPUs had gotten faster relative to the memory bandwidths. This is further backed up by the number of the 6th gen CPUs which have a rather sharp increase in normalised memory bandwidth, starting with Skylake. This is where the CPUs are as slow as they're ever going to get on this DDR revision, and as a result they're going to have some of the lowest CPU speed to memory speed ratios. However, as CPUs overclock further, like a delay did i7 7700K, and an extremely fast memory for DDR4 standards hasn't come out, the 7th gen i7s are likely going to crash. This won't affect the i5s, as I doubt everyone is going to delay an i5. In this case, the i5 in 7th gen was running at a measly 3.8GHz, which caused the i5s to spike on the graph. Lastly, the case for the 8th gen i7 is much the same as for the i5s. The additional two cores increased the memory bandwidth requirement by about 50%. Now this coupled with the faster DDR4 that's coming available, the drop on the chart isn't quite 50%. So after looking at all of this, I seem to be in a few different minds about CPU memory limitations. I feel like I still don't really have enough data to say what kind of performance impacts we may be seeing as a result of tight memory restrictions. And lastly, it seems pretty unpredictable as to what is going on in the coming years. Honestly, I think that if I made a graph like this even in a few years, the CPUs that will come next will be on an upward trend, as long as car count doesn't change. The reason being clocks are reasonably tough to increase, but I know that the really fast DDR4 will be coming out soon, and then DDR5.